You've just recreated the worst possible nightmare. Fiscal year 1999, 2.3 trillion missing. Fiscal year 2000, 1.1 trillion missing. You think with two mortgages out, the repo guy's staking out my car, my job on the line. Even when we win, it's just a matter of time before we give it all back. There are serious financial management problems. Are we potentially at a point where we might actually lose the financial system as we know it? You're standing there and you suddenly realize, hey, I'm still here. Don't be a victim of the current economic crisis. Turn the tables on the banksters, collection agencies, and other crooks. You can stress out trying to find a way to make the minimum payments every month, or you can get them to pay you. Join hosts Jesse and Dave every Monday at 12 p.m. Eastern Time for What Lies in Your Debt, right here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. Where information never sleeps. Good evening, good day, everyone. Welcome to Researchers on a Mission Radio. I'm your host, Joe Kiernan. We'll be speaking on the topic of particular phenomenons dealing with lights, UFOs, and other activities, uh, possibly more as much as I can pick my guest brain tonight. Uh, I've met him prior before uh, in person. We've had conversations, but now that I have him live on the air, I get to ask questions I would have never asked in person. <laughs> I'm only kidding around. Uh, it's an excellent guest we're going to have tonight. Uh, he's an excellent researcher. He's very thorough. Uh, he's, uh, he's one of the few uh, researchers out there in the field that will uh, hesitate to jump to conclusions, even though he may see things with his own eyes where others are uh, quick to label something and, uh, and, and try to find ways to, to disprove it, but uh, don't go about it in the proper fashion. Uh, he'll be explaining the ways he goes through things and the projects he's worked on. And I know his knowledge in the field is extent and, uh, and profound. Uh, I met him a decade ago and I was impressed with him then. And, uh, his, his knowledge has only grown in time. Uh, of course, I'm speaking of the UFO researcher, Michael Parker, who uh, recently just had a show. Uh, it's actually airing tonight. Uh, uh, it's, it's uh, airing tonight on the East Coast at 11 p.m., and it's dealing with the Marfa lights. And uh, before we get there, I just want to remind everyone uh, we are co-hosted by my good friend, Dave Stinnett, and produced by Tim C. Tim C., how are you, buddy? Doing well. How about yourself, Joe? How Doing was Christmas? good, man. Doing good. Oh, it was good. Thank you very much. I hope yours was well. Yes, it was fun. Yeah, yeah. Mine, uh, I value mine on the size and frequent smiles of the children. So I think I did okay this year because uh, that's good. they threw a lot of wrapping paper at me. So that's usually a sign. Something good, I believe. Yeah, you probably sure. did a good job. They did make me breakfast. That's the benefit of having a bunch of girls in the house. They, they do make a good breakfast. So I was really happy. Great Christmas. Great, great Christmas. Good to hear it. With, with without further ado, I really would like to bring uh, our guest in, Tim. Uh, Mr. Michael Parker, are you there with us? I am here. Thank you. Yes. How are you? I'm doing good, Joe. Thanks for inviting me on the show. I really appreciate it. And thanks for the kind words and the uh, introduction. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure. It's uh, Thank you for coming on the show. You just had your recent episode premiere on the Travel Channel. Uh, can, can you uh, – can we – before we get into that, can you, uh, you tell us how did you begin your efforts in the UFO field, in the community? What, what was the, the driving factor for you to say, uh, I'm, I'm going to look into this a, a little more before it turned into a passion? I'd be glad to do that, Joe. Um, all my life, I've, I've been interested in uh, UFOs, uh, unknown phenomena, anomalous things. I'm a Scorpio. Um, I'm into mysteries. I'm just a... I'm a very curious person and I'm, but I'm also skeptical. So I'm, I'm one of those people that I'm always looking for an additional answer instead of the easy answer. I never believe, or well, I often don't believe what I'm told um, initially. And, you know, I trust my gut. So as a kid, um, I was really into science fiction and I was a massive reader. Um, you know, what, what, 
when I was growing up, there was no computer. So you had television, you had the radio, and you had books. And the things that really interested me um, were subjects related to space. I grew up on a farm in West Texas, and we were far away from anyone. Um, consequently, I spent a lot of my time looking up. And when you live in a rural area, you can actually see the magnificent sky in its true spectrum. I live in Los Angeles now. When I go out into my backyard, I'm circled by a fence. There's a lot of ambient light. I, I can see very little. But as a child growing up on a hill in the middle of nowhere, I was able to see the Milky Way. I was able to see everything that is the splendor of space and interstellar space and wonder. And we were also very close to an Air Force base. So these giant B-52s would fly very low over our house sometimes on their way to uh, Dias Air Force Base, which is in Abilene, Texas. So I just always looked up and looked at the stars and I remember the Apollo missions as a child just being fascinated by that. And when I was in the third grade, I bought my first book on uh, you know the UFO phenomena. And I think I mentioned it to you privately, the book was called uh, This Baffling World. And it was uh, a book that I still have. And it mentioned uh, Project Blue Book and these various UFO sightings throughout history. And I was like, as a kid, I'm like, wait a minute. So if the government was keeping records on these things, then how can this be nonsense? I just, you know, and then I showed it to my dad. And my dad, you know, being the good Texan that he is, he just looked at me. He's like, ah, don't believe everything you read. That's good advice. And I still, I still uh, adhere to that today, but I just knew in my gut, like, look, there is something here. And I would see pictures of uh, famous sightings. You know, I grew up in the 70s. So this book was, uh, came out in the 70s. So all the pictures that I was seeing were black and white pictures taken during the 40s and 50s and early 60s. And I was hooked. So as a teen, I continued to read literature on uh, UFOs and um, all forms of para paranormal uh, phenomena. And then I, uh, I became a musician and an artist for a while, and that took a great deal of my time. But I always um, continued looking into the UFO phenomena in particular. That was always my favorite, the, the ET hypothesis. And so all my life, I've been a quiet researcher as a hobby, if you will, uh, while I you know, pursued uh, regular jobs and regular life. I currently work in the entertainment business. I actually work on a television show and um, I'm not going to name it here because it has nothing to do with what we're talking about. But, um, you know, by day I work in television. Um, so my interest in UFOs and all forms of paranormal has existed throughout my life. Several years ago, for two years, I hosted a show called Dark Matter. Now, this is before, you know, Art Bell decided to name his new show Dark Matter. So I had right. a show for two years called Dark Matter. And I, I interviewed a lot of uh, UFO people on Jim Mars. Um, is one of my favorites, but I interviewed, uh, you know, psychics. I interviewed people on alternative medicine, alternative history, uh, conspiracies, a lot of 9-11 stuff, just stuff that I found interesting. And um, so after that, I was hired by Discovery to do a show for Discovery called Scared Nation. We spent a long time on that, and it was to be a, a UFO uh, show was the first episode. Um, the executive producer of that show is the executive producer of Mythbusters. We spent a long time on the show. Then they decided they didn't want to air it and can the show. So after that, I was like, wow, what do I do now? So it took me a couple of years to get back on my feet because I didn't really want to do, um, I, I wanted to get some form of infrastructure under me so that I could spread my message in a bigger way. So it's been a couple of years of learning the business. And um, recently I got contacted by Indigo Films who is doing this show, America Declassified. Now, one of the directors and producers on that show is one of the people that I had worked with on the Scared Nation episode. And uh, he and I got along great. He respected my knowledge on uh, this type of material. And he said, hey, look, we're doing the show. We've got a couple of episodes. I think you might potentially be a really good guy to be on this show. Here's one topic we're looking at. And we did some, uh, I'm not gonna name that one because it didn't end up airing. Um, he goes, what do you know about this particular topic? So I did some research. I got it over to him and I said, Seth, Seth Eisler is the director. Great guy. I said, listen, I really would love to work with your show. You know, I love this stuff. Um, 
you know, let me help you out. So I did some work. That episode didn't end up happening. He called me back later, a couple of months later, said, listen, what do you know about the Marfa lights? And I was driving home from work. And for 30 minutes on my way home, I just told Seth, you know, pretty much everything I knew about Marfa lights, which is a, that a lot of people think, or the skeptics think that it's nothing more than a uh, highway headlights. And, but the other side of it is that this may be plasma and there's other places in the world that these type of phenomena occur, not just uh, Marfa. I mean, in the U S alone, we've got places like uh, the Brown mountain lights, which are in North Carolina, which you may be aware of um, in Arkansas, they got a Dover light. Um, there's a Hebron light in Maryland. Um, these, these things happen in different places. So it's not just a Marfa phenomena. And in these different places, sometimes you've got a confluence of events where yes, they are optical illusions. And in other places, we've got something that I think is in fact plasma. And uh, one of the other people that was in the show for the people that have seen it is a gentleman named James Bunnell. And I would guide anyone who's curious about plasma as a source of um, earth lights or ghost lights or spook lights to look into his work because this man did 10 years of study in Marfa. And I think his, his science is pretty solid. I mean, he's an aerospace engineer by trade and for 10 years did this work on his own. So anyway, I was aware of his work. I tell Seth what I, I know about Marfa lights and what I think they are. And for about 30 days afterwards, we kind of just go back and forth, trading phone calls, texts, emails, research. And finally, he's like, you know what? Let's try to get you on the show. I was like, great, I'd love to do it. Um, and uh, it worked out and I was glad to do it. And it worked out and I thought it was a good show. We did it in the end of October, early November. And I know that uh, American Declassified just got picked up for a second season. So hopefully we'll do some more UFO um, anomalous phenomena type uh, subjects. I would hope so. I know uh, I've had a good response in regards to your show. Uh, there's uh, quite a few people that reached out to me and said uh, what you were doing there, they'd like to have done. You know, a lot of people, uh, you know, feel there's a lot of show that goes on. But, uh, you know, when you roll into town with uh, with a good set of cameras and the FLIR truck and and uh, and you set up with real science on the spot, it really goes a long way. And, we were uh, very we were very fortunate to, to be able to partner with FLIR because the, the Marfa lights in particular are subtle. And, you know, you've got to know what you're looking for. And even when you see them, they blink in and out of existence. They move around. They're very subtle. You have to get lucky to even see them in the first place. So we were very happy that the, the FLIR team was able to come out and work with us. You know, uh, two, two people today that I know, uh, one, as I mentioned to you earlier in the day, uh, from Vancouver, uh, Charles, true. he's been on the show before, uh, great guy. And uh, Allison Cruz in PA, uh, she's excellent. She's been on the program a few times. And uh, Michael, you know, uh, we've spoken about her. Uh, yes. These these two people uh, mentioned that they do have difficulty with the thermal. Uh, they're you know they're not necessarily saying uh, thermal's no good here, but they're they're saying uh, they've tried that out and that's really not the route they need to go. They uh, like Allison Cruz says she needs a spectrometer. Uh, for uh, light spectrum analysis, uh, you know she's she's gotten to the point uh, with so much gear and so many people have uh, looked at it, and uh, she's she's gone through FAA reports. And I mean, she, Allison Cruz is really dotting eyes and crossing T's up there in response to uh, covering all aspects. I mean, when you when you look at what she's working with, you really just end up with saying, really, what else could this be? You know, there's we we can't answer for it. Uh, she she sure she is trying to get an answer for it, and uh, she's not getting anywhere. And there's a few people out there, and there's a lot. Of, there's a few people that really want to get some answers where they really have legitimate activity going on, but uh, a lot of times there's a, a big production that goes into getting them attention. And uh, sure. I wish there was a way. You know, I wish there was somewhat of a uh, a, a response team sort of show where you could we could just roll into these spots and and set up and. You know, without putting a, a, a big show into the works. Right. Well, let me let me go back to the first thing about the thermal. Listen, I I agree. I mean, for me, this type of subject, and this pertains to anything, UFOs, 
ghosts. Listen, we have to put everything on the table. So I do not disagree with them that thermal is the only way to try to find this uh, subject matter and, and verify it. And certainly uh, spec spectographers. Um, yeah, you know, there's a lot of people that say thermal is the key. But, you know, I was just mentioning there's a few people that, you know, like what else could we be using, Michael? You know, is, is there well, anything else that you know of? Listen, I think you have to use every tool that you have. And right now, what, what most people have, the, the, the layman in the field has got a video camera or a, a phone, and generally that's all they're going to have. They're not going to have night vision goggles. They're not going to have some form of thermal camera. Although, in both cases, uh, consumer-grade um, tools like that are becoming more affordable. So we, as, as individuals, even if we're not attached to a television show or some form of funded study, now have much better tools at our disposal than people had just five to 10 years ago. So I think that the educated investigator takes what they can afford and takes what they have at their disposal into the field and tries to gather as much information as they can. The, the problem is, is that none of this uh, is predictable. You know, so, I mean, you've got a situation, we go out into the field and we're looking for something, whether it is a, a UFO or a a ghost or Bigfoot or some kind of cryptozoological uh, creature, listen, you can't predict that you're actually going to have any results. So I think more often than not, you just go out there with what you have and hope that something happens and hopefully you've done your homework. And for me personally, what I have done the most of is just I'm trying to gather and aggregate as much information as I can to try to come to my, to some sense of, uh, just try to gather as much knowledge as possible because there's a lot of people doing things and, and I never trust anyone when they say they know what something is because it's the minute somebody says, well, listen, here's what it is, is the minute I know they're, you know, probably slightly full of bullshit and everything has, <laughs> everything has to be on the table because we simply do not have enough information to know what any of these things are at this point. Although we do have enough data to know that something in fact is happening. I can't agree with you more, you know, uh, because it's you never have enough tools when you're out there in the field, right? Because you, yeah. everyone always says, oh, you should have had this. You should have had that. I mean, really, you can't have everything. No. And, and there, you know, while you were talking, you maybe think there's this one guy in, in the uh, near the Brown Mountain Lights in the North Carolina area. And this guy tells me that he can't capture anything unless it's in thermal. And he'll have two cameras running side by side, one being infrared and the other, yeah. other being thermal. And, yeah. you know, what's, what was always strange to me was, uh, you know, I – the limited knowledge I have in regards to filming with thermal is I'm used to it being an animal, you know, sure. some sort of a heat signature related to an animal. So I, I, it, it was always puzzling to me that he has something in the, in the sky that he can't, you know, camera side by side and uh, pick it up on thermal and not on infrared. It, it's always so strange, but then again, that's the Brown Mountain Lights. Every time I try to learn more on it, it's that's some strange stuff going on up there. Joe, but, we had some of this. We had some of the same issues. I mean, some of these lights did not show up in the thermal, which you know, as you said, this this means there's no heat signature. Well, I can't quote the the number, but um, Roy Malmberg, who's in the show, gave me the the specs on this camera, and it was insane. I mean, it's a hundredth of a degree or something. So. Whatever this thing is, sometimes when we couldn't catch it in the in the thermal, that means it's generating zero heat. Wow. So it's a neutral matter. And then on the other hand, we, we caught some in the thermal. So uh, this is, you know, this is strange stuff. This is exotic matter. And nothing surprises me at this point. They're very elusive. And um, you just work with what you got and hope for the best. You know, you said exotic matter. Do you think yes. there's a possibility? Let, let's say in regards because you were just – you were there and the, yeah. the recent showing of the Marfa lights. Being an exotic matter, do you think there's an organic nature to it? Do you think, do you think it, it's uh, a phenomenon or do you think there's a possibility of intelligence correlated okay, so somehow? I'm so glad you asked that because as you saw on the show, there was a gentleman named Scott Deshaies. And Scott is a great guy. I had not met him before this. Now, he brought to the table the idea that earth lights, spook lights, many UFOs are actually some form of a living bioluminescent organism. 
And at first, I'll be, I'll be honest, I was absolutely just not buying it, not feeling that at all. And, um, you know, in the beginning of the show, I say, well, listen, you're talking about something in the desert that's bioluminescent and flying around in the air. Um, I just, but the more that I talked to Scott, the more I was impressed with his knowledge. And even if it is not the answer, I'll tell you one thing, Scott DeShane is, he would, ne he would never call himself a ufologist, but he has an excellent grasp on the history of ufology. And you should have him on, his sh on your show because he's a great guy. And when he starts bringing up his point of view on this, because he starts describing all of these old historic UFO cases, which I can't remember until he brings them up and he goes, you remember, they, they described it da, 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 as this, and that does sound more like an organic uh, creature than it does some form of structured craft. And as a matter of fact, um, in the beginning, the Air Force and some of the government um, bodies that were looking into UFOs did seem to think that, you know, perhaps these are some form of biological uh, entities as opposed to, you know, a craft or something. So I would urge you to bring Scott on at some time. He's a super cool guy. Um, has a great knowledge of ufology, but he is coming to it from the point of view that perhaps some of these are um, aerial living creatures. Now, that being said, I do not think that's what's happening in Marfa. I think that's what, what's happening in Marfa is a mixture of three things. 97% of the time, and this is these are statistics um, that James Bunnell has put forth in his work. By the way, his... his uh, website, if, if people want to go to it, and I highly suggest that they do, is nightorb.com, I believe. Just one word, nightorb.com. And it's James Bunnell. Anyway, his stats are that 97% of the time, 96, 97% of the time, what people are seeing, if they go to the Marfa Lights viewing station in Marfa, Texas, they're really seeing headlights. Now, the other 3% of the time, they're seeing um, either plasma which is coming up out of the ground and is not visible until it hits the atmosphere. And then you have a chemical ele electric uh, situation that actually causes the outside of the plasma sphere to come alight. And if that plasma will go in and out of visibility, depending on if it's burning on the outside or not. Now, the other couple of percents, you're seeing what he calls Fata Morgana mirages. And Marfa is a very strange place. First of all, you're 5,000 feet up in the air. This is the highest altitude for a uh, town in the state of Texas. And when you get there, it looks very strange. I compare it to almost a snow globe in the desert. You know snow globes that you get for Christmas or the holidays? Do you hold it and you shake it up? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Well, when you're at Marfa, it kind of feels like that because you're in this barren area encircled by these strange mountains, some of which are... Um, former uh, volcanoes. But when you're there, you kind of get this slight curvature of the earth. You've got these mountains. It's just very strange. Now, because you're up so high and you're in the desert, what happens is at night, the air that is close to the ground becomes cool. And we're in far west Texas. The air coming up over the mountains from other parts of the desert is hotter. So you've got warm air on top of cool air, which means that now you have these temperature inversions and it causes light to literally bounce around and behave in very strange manners. And uh, it can create mirages. So 97% of the time you are just seeing car headlights. The other 3%, you're either seeing plasma or you're seeing these Fata Morgana mirages. Really strange. That is. Because there's a, a, the, few, the few people I was reading about with the, the Marfa lights, there's a few people that are quite adamant they're not even filming in the direction where there's cars and, and you're right you're right but um, i mean it, you you took a good look at it it's uh i, I don't know well, what you saw i don't know what that was that, no was, you're right and it was really cool joe I, I i understand why people say that it's car lights most of the time it is car lights and yeah you're if you're looking over at 67 if you're looking to the right side of the radio tower most likely you're seeing car lights. Now, if you look in the other direction, which is where we were, where we saw bona fide Marfa lights, 
There are no automobiles in that area. That's just wide open prairie plain. But I understand why people, you know, listen, until you do the homework, and this is the case with most, uh, most people when they start talking about unknown material like UFOs or ghosts, or you start talking about conspiracies, those who've done no harm homework are usually the first ones to say, well, it's all nonsense. And the more you learn, the more you're like, wow, I really don't know what's happening here because I understand where they're coming from, but you, you can't even talk to those people about it because they don't have enough material at their disposal to even know what they're talking about. So it's easier just to discredit the whole situation. Uh, but yeah, uh, spook lights, earth lights, ghost lights, mystery lights, in many cases, people are seeing refracted light as a result of either temperature inversions or some form of optical illusion. That being said, it does not make the phenomena any less mystical to behold. And it also, the idea of plasma coming up out of the ground, I mean, that's just fascinating. Plasma, first of all, when I was a kid, you only learned about three states of matter, solid, liquid, gas. That's well, true. now, many people call matter um, plasma, the fourth state of matter. And within the universe itself, plasma is the most common form of matter. The sun is made of plasma. Um, stars are made of plasma. And the northern lights, the aurora borealis is made of plasma. But it's only now that we're kind of beginning to understand what this is. And it's this very exotic form of matter. So to me, it's still really, really cool, really, really interesting. And who knows, man, maybe, uh, maybe there's a link to UFOs that we haven't discovered yet because maybe there maybe they are surrounded by plasmas in, in sometimes when they're traveling, who knows? I, I just put it all out there. There's no decisions being made. It's just all fascinating to me and um, worth well, a look. I'm really happy you were able to go out there with the gear you had and, yes. and capture what you did uh, for you know, really a really good look for people to take a good look at because I've seen a, a few now, but uh, I definitely applaud you on that. Thank but, you. you know, there's something I wanted to return to, Michael. You had mentioned sure. where, when you were growing up that uh, you had a lot of time uh, observing. Uh, yes. You had a lot of time to observe and, and uh, be open-minded. As you mentioned, the Milky Way, you were looking out, you were into sci-fi, you were, you, were, you were dreaming, you understood the possibilities existed. And, and you had an open mind. And, and a lot of times those are the people who are musically inclined. Sure. And, and, you know, I also hear a lot that comes right in hand with being open-minded and fully observant like that is those usually are the people that have some sort of experiences. And there's a lot of other people that have been telling me that uh, sometimes it's more of the, the, the people that can see these things as opposed to uh, just a lot of people seeing these. Sometimes it's just an individual. Uh, do you believe, do you think that holds any value? Joe, I absolutely do. And, and I will make it even, even uh, some might say cynical, but I say simpler. I, listen, the way people live today, people don't even look up. I mean, people are looking at their phone. They're looking down. They're looking down the street. They're looking across the street. Nobody's looking up. And even if they are looking up, if they're in a, uh, a metropolitan area, there's not, you know, you can't see that far. And I believe it's called the cargo cult phenomena back in the day, you know, when um, a more advanced culture is seen for the first time by primitive culture, they try to interpret that in whatever symbols they have in their own mind. So I, I don't remember which uh, island it was, but these particular primitive people tried to build their version of aircraft because they had seen um, the more advanced uh, civilization come to visit them and they had aircraft. My point being is that most people don't look up. Most people aren't looking for these types of things. And even if they see them, they aren't going to give them credit because in their mind, they have already decided that, well, if I see anything peculiar, it is most likely aircraft. And listen, most of the time they're probably right, but I think that you have to be open to it. You have to be looking for it. And um, I, I, our culture these days doesn't really promote that type of an idea. People aren't looking, well, I take that back. There are people like us who are curious about these matters and we will go out and we will try to find them and we will look up and we'll have video cameras. And if we're lucky, we might catch something. But a lot of people, 
that's not even something they're going to bother to do. You're right. You know, Mike, they, people are Michael, too busy. You're right. you're right, because I'll tell you right now, nine out of ten experiences, paranormal experiences that I've had in my life, Joe Kiernan was right next to me. Yep. If anyone's haunted, it's Joe Kiernan. Whoa, aliens haunted. are following anyone else. <laughs> it's Joe Kiernan. <laughs> you can say I had a good spirit following me around. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, you're right. I mean, you don't I saw a UFO with Joe. <laughs> there you go. You don't necessarily have to be looking for it because the times that I saw things with Joe, we were definitely not looking for it. Well, that's so. one of the great things about the both of you is you you weren't quick to say, yeah, that was a UFO. We, you know, Michael says, is, again, we were talking earlier today. He was there. He saw it. And, and I'm saying, I, I don't know what I saw. And, and instantly he's saying, you know, there's other possibilities. There's this and right, that. Right. And, and he was there where well, other you- people are quick to say, no, I saw a UFO. Uh, don't get me wrong. I don't know what it was. And I, I just went over that in my head trying to think, what could it be? What could it be? Because it's just funny. I think that was the first day I ever met you, Joe. It was. It was. Yeah. I met, okay. If I may it, take it was, a second. It, 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 was, it, was, it was a strange set of circumstances. And it yes, was it was. An incredible day. And I, 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 it just all came so fast and it was gone. And I said, what in God's name just happened here? What was I it? Met Joe, I, I'll just tell the audience so you don't have Go to Go since ahead. you're the host. And um, but I met Joe uh, through a very close friend of mine, mutual friend of ours and uh, our mutual friend. And I, you know, we very into UFOs. And Joe, I believe you were staying with Jeff, I think. Right. Well, I, I had my own I had my own place, but it was it was right off the of Hollywood Boulevard. It yes. was it was a scary place to go after dark, even being from New York. So. Uh, I, I usually found a way to just uh, stay over at Jeff's place. He always lived on, in a, on a nice part of town. <laughs> well, I went to go visit you guys. He, he said, I have a friend uh, I want you to meet. I went over there, and we went up on the top of Jeff's um, apartment that day. I don't, I don't remember if we saw something from the balcony, but we literally, on the first day I ever met you, we saw a UFO together. That's true. Uh, we, we did see it, and, I, and we ran up onto the rooftop because yes. he, had, he had a flat rooftop. And, uh, you know, the thing was right there. We were all staring at it. It just happened so fast. And yeah. it was, you know, I was expecting after a few seconds to say, oh, no, everyone, it's 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 a kite. It's this. It's that. But I, I don't even know what it was. It was just so strange. It was I, I can't even explain it. But those are always the times that it's just so puzzling. And, and you just say, what, what was that? You know, but then also uh, I also noticed that. Uh, you doubt yourself rather quickly. At least I did. It said, "No, it it couldn't have been." And right. I could I could see why a lot of people who just see something one time in their life instantly doubt themselves, and yeah. and, and it and it lie at that. And the other thing I always hear is, "How come the only people reporting UFOs are smokers? Because right. they're <laughs> usually the only people outside, just standing around. Everyone else is goes from their job to their house as fast as they can." Or, uh, they're only outside taking out the trash. Very rarely are people just outside observing. So it's usually the smokers just standing around. That's uh, true. Michael, you had a good point, though. Most people aren't looking up. Most people are just going about their daily business. And yes. the people that do happen to catch something that aren't looking, either they are part of that group of people that are just hypersensitive to these types of things, and they just pick up on things quicker, or they just happen to be in the right place at the right time. That's right. And, and, and not to beat us up, but when you, know, you were saying that I, I doubted myself, and, but here's the, here's the problem. Um, we as investigators have to doubt ourselves a little bit because, and when I say doubt, that's not even the right question or the right word. We have to be skeptical because, listen, there is a large part of the population that wants nothing to do with this. So from the get-go, you're already fighting a losing battle when you take some data to them in the form of a photograph or video or what have you. So just for us, I think it's good to start off when you, okay, we've, we're seeing something right now, right? Like say we're seeing some form of phenomena. It's good for us to take a skeptical stance from the immediate right ground zero, but start documenting it. And then if you can figure out what it is later, that's great. Or if it's if it's indefinable, that's, that's fine. But I think... He, too many people, especially when they're new to this type of research, they listen. And I'm the, I'm that guy too because when the internet first started occurring, and I, and and I had my own computer. Well, you know, I started reading a lot more material about UFOs than I had known beforehand. And you start getting excited, and you start wanting to believe what these people have to say, and some of it sounds so fantastic. 
but we have to step back a little bit and I see it on the, I see it on Facebook. Um, I'm, I got added to this uh, group, which will go unnamed on here right now because I don't, it, I don't think I need to name it. Anyway, there's some young people on there who post a lot of stories, which are entertaining to me, but I'm just like, there's nothing to back it up. They're fantastic stories. They're highly entertaining, but they're extremely far out, and there's just nothing to back up what's in the story. And the only reason I bring that up is because we as researchers kind of have to be a little bit hard on ourselves because we're up against a very difficult subject to get any form of confirmable data upon. And so we have to be our, we have to be the skeptic first and uh, just start from there, if that makes sense. Oh, it absolutely. Well, I, I'm with you and in full agreement with you because if you jump to the conclusion right off the bat, uh, usually those people are ignorant to any ideas any further. Right. And, and you really have to look into it. I, I, I've learned real quick, especially in the UFO community, uh, the, the people who are going to criticize you are going to come at you right away. And then yeah. the people who look through it all and hear everything you have to say, they're usually not so critical. They may disagree with you, but they're not going to be a critic about it. All they're simply going to say is, I've looked at his findings, and, and I disagree. But uh, usually when someone investigates thoroughly, uh, it's usually not met with criticism. Agreed. Uh, and, and that's what this whole UFO community should be. Uh, they want it to be more uh, properly uh, taken as researchers uh, on the scientific level. And in order to do that, you, you really have to be thorough. You have to put forth an idea. You, you have to look at it from multiple ways. And you have to look at every possibility of what it could be and try to rule them out. Yes. And we also have to put into account just because we can recreate something that might be similar does not necessarily make it the same, uh, which which happens all, all too often where it's, is you know, one time, uh, you know, someone sees something five times and it's and it's yellow and then the sixth night there's a yellow flare and they know it's a yellow flare. It doesn't necessarily make the other nights flares as well. So that really needs to be looked at. And that's usually high on criticism as well. Joe, let me pick up on that. And, and Please listen, do. For, for, in, 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 in a, I want to be in full disclosure. I work in the television business. So what you just said, I think is critical regarding some television shows in the paranormal, because a lot of times, okay, we saw such and such kind of lights. Now we're going to go out, you know, for the for our show, we're going to try to duplicate the lights by using um, Chinese lanterns or what have you. But the problem with that is, yeah, you might create something that looked like the phenomena that was first recorded, but it doesn't mean that's what it was. And so I only say that as a person who loves to watch paranormal programming, but I say that to the audience as a person involved in the business to, to take that with a grain of salt. And um, it's just part of making television. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying it is what it is. And that's, you know, it's funny because one of the people working on our show, I heard this afterwards, was in the edit bay and was certain that um, we had taken flashlights out into the desert to, to make fake lights. Right. We didn't do that. But, you know, I still kind of, you know, it's funny and, and I can, you know, I work in the business. I can see where people might, ah, oh, you guys faked that or something. Sure. We didn't. But at the same time, if you're trying to be dramatic and you're trying to create some kind of phenomenon and say, well, you know, it could have just been car headlights because we put some car headlights out there. That still is not a provable um, thing that, that it was car headlights. So right. I'm not trying to uh, criticize my show. I'm just saying in general, just take that as what it is and know that there's still other possibilities. Even if they were car headlights and then you demonstrate that you can do it as car headlights, that doesn't mean that certain phenomena does occur in that place that isn't that. I, I agree. I mean, it's, it's, I see it all across the board. And, yeah. and I would imagine a few first timers or someone who have maybe caught something on video uh, just, just being bombarded and saying, you know, it's not even worth it because I understand the difficulties that people have when they want to report a UFO or or really try to convince someone they did uh, where they're certain because it, 
let's be serious. Usually the first person you tell, they're going to doubt you. You know, right. it, it, it's, it's very rare people say, oh, really? Well, let's get to the bottom of this, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So it's it's very it's really tough for a lot of people, but I do understand that um, from the TV aspect that you have to look at it skeptical, and because that's really how it has to be done. But it does fall into uh, I love the the old Latin expression post hoc ergo propter hoc. It, it basically is uh, every time it rains, my knee hurts, and my knee hurts today doesn't mean it's raining. Right. You, you know, so Perfect. if if you could create something, uh, you know, we're, we're almost at that age that we can recreate anything. And, and that's what it boils down to. And, yes, there's a lot of crafty people out there that I'm sure are hoaxers. Yes. But, you know, there there are people out there that do experience phenomenon that have a very difficult time getting that truth out there. Certainly. Uh, and, and they are met with heavy criticism. And usually these are the people that – uh, they're so certain about it, it's not worth their troubles to argue it. They just say, fine, I'll just right. keep this to myself. And it's it's really strange. There's there's someone who uh, goes by the name of Mojo, Michael. And, uh, he's up in the Northwest. And I don't know what he's filming. He's He films some amazing stuff. Uh, he's he's uh, very low-key and rightfully so. He He cares a lot about what he's seeing. And he's got things on the ground, you know. Um, he's fi he's filming things on the ground as well as lights in the sky, and there's things walking around. And um, he's putting the material on YouTube. Yes, yes. I'll look into it. Yeah, who took my mojo is his okay. YouTube page. Actually, he's, I think you sent me. I think I did yeah, see some stuff. Yeah, he's he's a, he's a he's a friend of the programs. Good. He's a, he's a friend of mine. Uh, he's been very helpful. Uh, with getting me to look at things a little differently when I'm trying to film. Uh, he works with great gear, and and he's just a, an example of uh, someone who is quite adamant and certain that they're experiencing something irregular, and they feel they haven't quite found the right people to turn it over to. And, uh, and, and I respect that Yes. because uh, a lot more often than not, these people, when they reach out, uh, the, the people that they're looking for are usually not the ones who respond. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, there are people, let's say as myself, where at times when I happen to see things, you know, I'm not far from my house. And, uh, and I understood trying to say something myself a while ago that it might draw attention to where I live, of course. But uh, it was kind of easy for me to do once I realized uh, other people were seeing it elsewhere. It wasn't just outside my house. Yes. So, so I didn't mind really speaking up. But, but I could tell you just to get me to speak out about it, uh, it was several conversations with my family because it's one thing just speaking out about it. it it's another thing to uh, do it publicly. Yes. You have to con consider – uh, the view towards a lot of other people that you care about. And so a lot of people have a lot to lose in making these claims, uh, but it, it's too bad with with uh, a lot of the media today that we, we don't have some sort of a reality-based show, if you will, uh, on a topic of the phenomenon uh, with these lights. It, um, I, I know it probably wouldn't be enough to do several seasons, uh, but it, it, I'm just speaking from my own point. If I had, if I had these capabilities, there's a few places I'd like to go to because uh, everyone seems to be looking, and there's a few people that are very, very protective of something special, and and uh, and and I wish they, I, I hope them well in finding the right person to talk to, because I really wish that they could share it with everyone, with without making a, a circus out of it. Right. But. It, uh, Go ahead, Michael. I'm sorry. It, it, it becomes difficult, and, and and you're you're exactly right. I mean, you when you start talking about subjects that are taboo to much of the populace, and 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 I don't think taboo is too strong a word here because I think it's a fair it's, word. It's it's something when we're when you're talking about UFOs and extraterrestrials, you're talking about something that some people are extremely uncomfortable with, and 
not only are they uncomfortable with it, but it, it just pisses people off. And a lot of those people, unfortunately, are the kind of people that we really could use their help. And, you know, scientists will often scoff at this type of material and they're like, Michael, don't you know that if we could find an alien or do this, that, or the other thing, what kind of grants we could get and how much money we could make? And can't you see that we really want that? Well, you know what? You're not really convincing me because there is a lot of data out there and I'm not seeing you do a convincing job of looking into it. Occasionally, um, like the French report, the Comita report, or um, Sturrock's report that came out of what it was, USC, like five, 10 years ago, something like that will pop up that, that has some serious uh, scientific study involved with it. But by and large, these guys don't want anything to do with this stuff. So it's left to people like you and I to stick our necks out there and have our family members think we're nuts or have our friends that we work with or whatever go, wow, he believes in that crap. But the deal is, it's to me, it's not such a mind boggling subject. It's, it's, a, it's a matter of, it's just a logical thing. It's, it's going to happen. Just sheer math says right. we absolutely cannot be alone. Now, I'm not saying that every time someone sees some form of strange light, that it is anything really unusual. It could be a number of things and most likely is a misinterpretation of something very tangible. However, there's also a lot of data that shows that for millennia, unusual things have happened and, have, and they've come from the sky. And then God bless these people who say that they've been abducted. I've not been abducted, knock on wood. I don't want to be. Um, if that is in fact real, then, and many people have said that it is, then it's a serious matter. It scares the hell out of people. Um, and to talk about it in certain company will just get you labeled a loon. But to me, it is something that is interesting to me. It is a possibility that it's occurring. Certainly many people think that it is. And somebody's got to do the homework. Somebody has to look around. Somebody has to look up. Somebody's got to say something. Well, hopefully soon enough. It, you know, I, I'm sure it's going to take a, a collective a collective uh, issue. I'm sure it's, Absolutely. it's going to take a, a lot of everything. But, you know, you had mentioned just prior that, you know, there is a possibility of life out there. And, you know, I, I agree with that. I completely do believe it's possible. Actually, I, I, I'm, I'm more on the side that it's certain. Uh, it, yes, it, I agree. It's, you know, even just uh, being a math guy, I am. It's, it's beyond possibility. It's, it's really so, more so, or less just where. Even uh, the Vatican is recognized as a possibility. Um, I don't remember what the number was earlier this, this – it was in November because I spoke with Bunel about this. There was another study where they were talking about they had upped – the number of planets in the Goldilocks zone within our own galaxy alone. And I believe it was something in the billions. I mean, the math is staggering, even with our own galaxy. And, and, you know, and there's billions and billions of galaxies. So to me, the question that exists is no longer there. Now the next question is, the other thing that irks me is when people say, well, why would they want to come here? As if planet Earth is not special, has nothing to offer. <laughs> we as a warlike um, civilization are just too dumb and primitive for anybody to take any interest as if the sphere that we live on has no natural resources that would be of worth to anyone as if we as scientists don't study a prim primitive animal or an ant or a chimpanzee. It's just that is a process of an intelligent creature to want to know more about the world and the universe it lives in. So that's one of the arguments that I hate. If they are there, and I'm sure they are there, then I'm also sure they are, they come here. Well said. Well, uh, you know, I I'm in agreement with you, uh, especially about this beautiful planet we live on. I mean, I see I see wondrous, beautiful things everywhere I look all day long. Yeah. Uh, granted, a lot of it's clouded by the mess we've made, but yes. But I do see all the the splendors and joys. Uh, I do. I also know geologically that, uh, you know, as we turn our telescopes to the skies, we look at planets passed by their suns, and with the light that's given off from the refraction, we're able to tell basically the composition of that planet. That's right. And uh, I know the thing that stands out about this planet is we're one of the densest rocks in the whole universe. We're just screaming out rare earth elements, heavy metal elements. The, yes. You know, all the all the things we're looking for, 
you know, all the all the the major metals we're hunting down, uh, it would certainly be a beacon for uh, a similar uh, species and in intelligence. Uh, it it only, I mean, for what we're based on, we're looking for these materials to progress technology. Uh, Agreed. Well, you uh, know, that that always that always struck me a part of the, what you just said there that uh, we are a dense planet and we are filled with these these elements. The fact of the matter is these elements are flying all around the universe at all times. This I'm is sure true. Land on all other planets as well. So what is special about us or are we special at all? I believe, I believe that it, here again, it's an all of the above. I believe that we as a species are special and the place that we exist is special. And if I am a civilization that is capable of interstellar travel, then why the hell don't I want to go to Earth? Man, I'm going to a lot of places. I am gathering information. I am mapping my space. I am you learning everything I possibly can about the universe that I exist in. Well, I mean, we've done it since the beginning of the time. I, we were building boats and trying to sail out to all the corners of the world. We were always pushing the boundaries, always no, trying I to see what's farther. That, I argue that that is the logical imperative of any intelligent species. I, I agree. I, I agree. Curiosity for knowledge. Yeah. I, I mean, it's it, it's really what it's the driving force for our, all, all instinct, as far as I'm concerned. Sounds right. good to me. Uh, as long so, as you can pull yourself away from your handheld tablet, of course. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and and don't get me wrong. I wasn't trying to get all uh, – I'm just passionate about that subject because here, listen, I don't want to live in Antarctica. You and me but both. I want to know what's in Antarctica. You're absolutely right. right. I, I would love to find out what's what's going on here. I know there's so much we have to know here. Sure. But uh, I do understand the importance of looking outwards as well. Yes. Uh, I don't Myself. understand the rush to colonize Mars, but I, I do understand looking outwards because uh, – just getting into it, guys. All right, everyone. We're just going to take a break for a few minutes. Uh, we'll be back with our guest, Michael Parker. Guest Hello, welcome back to Researchers on a Mission Radio. I'm your host, Joe Kiernan. Producing tonight, Tim, Tim C. We have Dave Stanett as co-host. And starting here, we'll have we'll be bringing back our guest, Michael Parker. Michael Parker. Tim C. Are you still there with us? I'm here. I'm here. I hear it, I hear too. it too. Let's see here. Let's see here. I'm not hearing it on my end. Michael, you're good over there, buddy? Yes. Sounds good, Joe. Okay. Looks like everything's all right. I'm sorry about the unbalance, folks. Let me roll back into this. We have Michael Parker as our guest tonight. Uh, he'll be speaking on quite a few topics, as many as I could get him to pour into. I'm going to try to get into a few. Uh, but before we get into that, I wanted to mention Michael Parker just had a show premiere this week. Uh, past, it's on tonight. Uh, it's on quite a bit. Uh, look in your local listings. It's on America Declassified, and it was dealing with the Marfa lights. Uh, we could also find Mar Michael Parker at CovertTruth.com uh, with two T's: C O V E R T T R U T H dot com. Also, his Twitter feed is at Michael Parker, L.A. And Tim C. is producing. Uh, Dave Stinnett is feeling a little under the weather. And uh, he's, he's here in high spirits. He's here with us in spirits. Uh, Michael Parker. Yes. Thank, thank you for sticking around through the break. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Oh, no. Our pleasure. Trust me. Uh, I'm, it's, I was really happy to have you on. Uh, you're a, a wealth of information. Uh, is, is there anything else before we dive back into it? Uh, is there anywhere else we could, uh, plug you in is, well, um, what I would ask to your audience, if, uh, if they liked, uh, the Marfa light show and they would like to see more UFO or, you know, slightly paranormal or that type of material on America declassified, go to, uh, the America Decla declassified page, which is, you know, just on the travel 
uh, channel website and just tell them, hey, we want more UFOs. We want more strange material because that is not the primary focus of the show. And I, I love the show and the people that make the show are great people. It's a great production company. But if they want to see more of that type of material, just go to the America Declassified page on the Travel Channel uh, website and let them know that you'd like some more of that because they did get uh, re-upped for a second season, which is great. And uh, if people want to see that type of material, then I would love to help make that for them. The other thing is I really just started uh, on Twitter recently and my website is brand new. I'll be putting uh, a lot of new material on coverttruth.com. If you go right there, if you go there now, you'll see the website. There's not a lot of material on it yet. It's brand spanking new. It's only a week or so old. Um, so yeah, I want more Twitter uh, friends. And uh, if you have suggestions of topics that you would like for me to look into, um, I'm more than happy to uh, try to do that. Well, you brought up an excellent point. A lot of people uh, usually only go to fill out the comments uh, with the stations and, and production companies when they have negative things to say. But, sure. uh, you know, go to Travel Channel and uh, we'll find a way. We're gonna, I'm going to post this on our site too. Uh, but it, I'd like to see if we could get everyone to go to America Declassified, go to their site, uh, tell them what you want to see. Tell them if you like yeah. the show, you want more UFOs, you want more paranormal. I mean, let's be serious, people. If you want to see it on TV, tell them what you want to see. Absolutely, because I'll tell, I'll tell you, as a member of the television industry, they are not that sold, and when I say they, I mean as a, I'm not talking about America Declassified, I'm just talking about television in general. Of course. People, people think that, you know, paranormal is a big genre. It's really not in the, in, in, in the scheme of the different types of shows that are on television. There are a lot of ghost hunting shows and things of that nature, but it's not as big as people think it is. And if they want that, they have to let the networks know that they really want more of that and for them to take it seriously when they do. Um, Cause some shows, you know, they're kind of making a joke of it or, you know, kind of taking the piss out of this, of the subject matter, you know, ah, oh, well, you know, it was this, that, or the other thing. And uh, we sorted that out. And next week we'll go down the road to Arkansas and we'll find something and debunk that too. If you want this type of subject matter taken seriously and you want to see more of it, then uh, support your favorite shows and go on the websites of the uh, the shows themselves or the production companies or the channels that make them and let them know, hey, we want to know more about UFOs. We want to know more about conspiracies. We want to know more about um, alternative history. Um, that's actually one of my other favorite subjects. And if you want to see those things, let the folks know because they are more than happy to give you more Kardashians <laughs> instead. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's never a shortage of that, uh, right. I see. And, and listen, I love the television business. I enjoy working in it, so I don't mean that in a disparaging way. It's just like anything else. It's, you know, let people know what you like, and then somebody will try to make it. And certainly this is my favorite subject matter, because and, and I want to make this more of this type of material. I want people to be inspired to ask questions. And don't feel stupid when these subjects come up, because... The more of us who are involved in this and the more of us who are asking questions and paying attention and getting inspired and going out there and looking and asking, hey, it just opens it up for more people in general. So um, if I could be anything, I would love to be an ambassador for thinking free and asking questions and looking up. You know, it's funny, uh, Joaquin in the chat rooms just posted something. He said... Uh... If we can have a channel for food and crappy reality shows, we can have one dedicated to the paranormal. I agree with that. Well, I, I, I see that being a possibility down the road. I, I see it happening. But I, I think it, it's all going to come from everyone speaking up. It's, yeah. you know, tell them what you want to see. If, if you like some shows and, and uh, you wish you had more of a particular topic, I mean, write about it. I mean, they'll, they'll do it. I mean, they're ultimately, it's entertainment, right, Michael? Yes. I mean, we're, they're yes, going to make what you want to see. I mean, uh, they're going to do the best they can at it. Exactly. I mean, it, it's what sells. Uh, if you want to see UFOs, uh, they're going to make more UFO shows, and you're going to get better investigators and better gear out of it. It's Agreed. It's, it's how it goes. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was hoping to dig into you a little bit when we okay. were talking about UFOs and the possibility of life beyond. Yeah. Now, there's a few people I've met that are, are stern individuals that feel uh, there's no correlation between UFOs 
and life within them. That uh, these are, I guess we would now refer to them as uh, droned vehicles. And uh, there's other people that feel that uh, these things that were visited by actually have some sort of a life within that is coming here for a general purpose uh, more than exploration. Uh, in, in your studies and the people have you, that you've spoken to through your time, uh, does that lean you to one side or the other if the fact that something may have come here with life in it, an exploratory life rather than Absolutely. just formal yeah. life? I, I, I think it's, here again, it's, it's all of the above. I think that um, craft have come here and I, you know, I almost don't even want to get into the subject of it. Is it, is it interdimensional or is it, you know, uh, nuts and bolts hardware? It, it, it's all of the above. And we don't know enough to make any form of firm decision of what this is. So, you know, you find your different factions within ufology that say, ah, oh, well, you know, it's, it's this or it's that or it's the other thing. Well, guess what? We really don't know because we've got all kinds of different stories, all kinds of different data. And I believe that when you're talking about the subject of UFOs, you first of all have to realize that we are talking about something that is unidentified. So I believe that, yes, some of these have intelligent organisms in them. They come here for their own reasons. Some of these could be drones. That certainly makes sense to me. Some of them may be... A primitive organism like Scott Deshane is talking about, where it is itself not even a craft, it is a flying organism. So the jury's still out. I think that all of the all of those things are actually happening right now. Yeah, I, I see a lot of that too. I mean, uh, I understand the the interdimensional. Yes, I, I do. I do, because too. I, I do understand the. There are other dimensions. I do understand I only can see three of them. Yep. Uh, I understand there are also humans that have no depth perception. They only see in 2D. Sure. Uh, I understand there are possibilities. Uh, however, uh, that doesn't account for uh, – that, that might account for things just disappearing and, and appearing, but there are people that see things come and go. Uh, right. There, there's also a lot of people – uh, that see a light phenomenon that claim it uh, comes from the ground. Uh, sure. It originates from the ground, and things come to and from the ground. And and the same goes for water. Uh, it seems uh, all too often these days I'm I'm hearing a lot of uh, water USOs. Uh, yes. Um, well, that's I, one of the, that's one of the most interesting things about your situation, and and when. Um, we, we first started talking and, you know, I was talking to your, our friend, Jeff, one of the first things that intrigued me about this is your proximity to water and where better to, yeah, okay, let's, let's take it all the way. If, if these are craft that are being guided, navigated by some form of civilization, individual thing, person, alien, mm -hmm. where better to hide most of the time than in the water. So um, if they could travel through interstellar space, they could certainly get through the water. And then, you know, you've got the cases where people claim to be seeing UFOs flying into volcanoes like uh, Mount Popo. So I would put it out there that if, if these craft can come here from wherever they're coming from, be it, be it our laws of physics as we believe it to be, or it is something interdimensional, if they can get here through those types of methods, then yeah, they water's not a problem. <laughs> Hot lava is probably not a problem. Um, they are. <laughs> it's funny, they, you know, they can the probably fly thinking, through the Earth itself. Um, the things so, you brought up earlier, Michael, was that um, in the Marfalites, you said that these were ancient volcanoes, and I, that right away struck me. Um, yes, the fact that uh, you know volcanoes really are a source of the inner parts of the of the of the Earth. The liquid hard metals. They yes. Come out from there. So I, I know there's a connection there with me. Tim, I'm losing you a little bit, but. Sorry, uh, guys. Uh, can you guys hear me? Uh, I hear you. I have uh, our friend Charles Lamaru's in here. Charles, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, Charles, how are you, my good friend? Doing great. Been watching, uh, listening to the whole show. It's been great. Are you staying warm? 
Uh, actually, not too bad. Wet though, really wet here in Vancouver. Well, that it's it tis the season, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, clouds, no stars, no UFOs. Michael Parker, we're joined with Charles Lamaru. He's the gentleman we were, we were speaking uh, of earlier from Vancouver, who's yes. uh, been experienced uh, some uh, interesting phenomenon as well. And uh, and to boot, if you will, he's uh, taken interesting ways on uh, searching for these lights and trying to get some answers. So I'm really happy he called in uh, because uh, he's been hard at work up there, and he's another gentleman who's covering his bases and. He's 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 at a quandary. How's so, saying? Charles? How are things going, man? Tell us about uh, the phenomenons. Well, yeah, I think my last one I, I filmed. Um, and sorry to interrupt. I know um, Michael was uh, getting into another great story, but I just want to tell you a little bit about my my last observation. I think all of you've seen it. It's the um, what I call the wobbler or the spinning disc one with the hole, which is the third time I've, third time I've seen it in the last few months. Well, finally, MUFON has taken great interest in it, and they want to do a complete investigation. Good. Well, that's so, progress. It's yes. progress, but again, it's slow. I mean, they've done this before with um, my observation last year, that energy orb, that Tesla orb that came around my balcony. And, you know, they did six months, and three different videographers looked at it, and they came back and said, well, you know what, Charles, we have no idea what this is, so we're going to just file it under the 9% of unknowns. And I never heard back again, you know, I know that. I didn't need them to tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you but know, I'm, I'm not going to try to take them down, but uh, I'm sure they gave it oh, yeah. the, the best of their interest efforts. Uh, no, and I appreciate it. And then, you know what? I'm glad that they've taken interest in this last one because it's the third time I've seen it. Um, it looks like the STS, you know, um, type of um, objects you see there that are very translucent and all of a sudden they're a solid uh, vehicle and this thing's spinning and, and all on different axes and it's it's got a hole in the middle and I could see with my, my plain eyes, of course I spotted it with night vision and it was very bright and it even had a, like a blue haze to it of some sort when you got really close with the binoculars. So of course having that observation now that's gone from my orbs to now see more of a solid craft I went out and bought some more darn video, you know, cameras with uh, itty optical zoom on it. So <laughs> I got no more money. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would love to see some of your footage. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll get the two of you uh, linked up together Thank because uh, he's he's uh, he's doing really good stuff. He, uh, I, Charles, I was telling him about uh, the hexacopter. Oh, yeah. I, I was I telling him off it. air. Yeah, I was telling him that you had taken the unorthodox route of modern technology and chasing these lights, which is uh, which which is new. It's exciting to me. I I'd love it. to do it. I got all the equipment. It's just now I just got to put it together. Um, I got the little night vision camera that I wanted. Um, I got the video. I mean, I got top of the line um, receiver and transmitter to put on it so I can go up to a mile even further out um, before I lose video transmission. So I got top of the line seven inch monitor so I can view this thing up in the air at night uh, in night vision um, for of course only about 12 minutes because the battery I have can only go for about 12 minutes. But I can put another battery, can, I can you know still put up another couple more pounds on that little uh, vehicle. So I'm planning to get it up in the air probably in the springtime um, and you know 15 minutes at a time at night, that's all I need for these orbs I see around my place to intercept it, and that's all I need. So these these orbs, you are you still seeing the same ones? I mean, I know uh, that they're like craft-like a little, but are they showing the same characteristics? Uh, well, well, now it's, it's well, I haven't seen the orbs because I haven't been out since because it's been cloudy like crazy, but um, the last time I was out really doing a sky watch was um, uh, in September when I spotted that last well, I've been out a couple of times after that, and I spotted uh, some other vehicles. But this last big one was in September. Was that um, uh, that spiraling, spinning uh, orb? Uh, sorry, um, saucer shaped. Yeah, that was pretty in the cool. Middle. Yeah. Um, so that was my real last one, but I haven't seen any orbs um, after that. So I don't know if it's um, they've now gone to you know going to bigger crafts now because you know it was all orbs before. Then it started. You know, 50, 60 at a time, star-like objects descending in the same area, part over Cypress Mountain, flashing and, you know, reacting to my laser. And then uh, now getting to more solid crafts that are spinning and, you know, just around the, around the city. 
And uh, other crafts, which is really ironic, I'm seeing Cessnas that don't really come low down over the city at a thousand feet chasing these things. And mm. I, of course, just missed it by recording it. I did record one of the aircraft just coming by after um, the object disappeared. But I see them banking and really low. So a set they like Cessna, single, single engine aircrafts. Uh, actually, it's double. Sorry, it was a that's, double engine. Oh, okay. Engine. Still, still, that's t Cessnas are pretty small. Yeah. yeah they know it. I guess they just saw it. Maybe they, they saw it in the sky like I did and they started chasing it. But it was quite interesting. So wow. um, I think this one, my last one I, I filmed, was only a couple thousand feet up in the air. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, uh, Michael, I'll, I'll get you uh, in touch with Charles. He's got really cool videos, especially the one he just uh, touched on where it was a, like a, a saucer. It was really strange. It really did look like some sort of a, a like a plasma disc. And it was... Uh, and it you was, said it looks like you said that it would look like some of the STS footage with the, the the white pulsing thing with the notch out of one side. I got another one with a notch on the side. I, I'll talk about that later. But this one that was just completely um, saucer shaped and it was spinning on its axis. And when you see it kind of spin on its side a bit, you'll see that there's a big hole in the middle, like a hole. It's either it's a hole or it's a, it's a bubble. I don't, but it looks like a hole. I blew it up digitally, and you'll see it's a big hole on it. And but it's more solid. It didn't have a notch in it. Um, more spherical, like a like a disc. Um, again, you'll be able to see it. I got two versions. I got the original version and uh, the digital version that I zoomed digitally. I'm, I'm not the best on the computer, by the way, so it wasn't very clear. And again, it was only it was shot in night vision on a Yukon Night Ranger. So again, it's not high definition, but you can clearly see the wobbler. And I got three of that same type of craft in, in um, different months over the summertime. Wow. And I first thought it was just a flashing, um, you know, uh, satellite or one of my flashing crafts that I see all the time until I saw it on the big screen and a screen that I see this thing was spinning and wobbling. So that's three times and I can definitely show you all three of them. Great. And this is all in Vancouver, British Columbia? All over, yeah. I only observe 99% of my time. It's on my balcony right downtown in the heart of the city with all the wow. light pollution. And this one was at about 3.30 in the morning. So I ruled out everything i've been doing this for just over two two and a half years now and um i ruled out all you know bugs and all the other balloons and everything like that um this is definitely either government vehicle uh or purely an alien craft there's only two things it could be that, that for me it's probably my better of all of my videos uh because of, of the strangeness um my orbs are another thing again this is not my show but um the orbs are pretty amazing too because I got them on laser, playing around with my laser light. Um, when they're completely small, the light and visible, and I'm going to a little point, like a little dot, and then I hit it with the laser light, and it's ten times the size because the laser reflected the invisible part of it, even in infrared. So mm -hmm. that's something you'd have to see too. That's what I thought was very interesting. Yeah, I definitely like to see all your material. Yes. So I'll, I'll let you guys continue because it's. Uh, your 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 this show is phenomenal. I've been listening to it from the beginning, and uh, again, the Marfa lights is brand new to me, and I think it's quite quite interesting. And your theories behind it, with plasma and everything. Um, but one question I have for you on those lights, sure. and I've been dying to ask you, because I wasn't too sure when you guys first spotted that light. Did you find it? Was it? Um, did you see it in the sky first before you you um, uh, saw it on the ground, or was it on the ground all the time? <laughs> The, the, the lights that I was shown pointing at? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I was the one who saw that because what happened was Scott DeShane and uh, David Williams, who's the ranch manager of the property that we were on, had gone and put three beacons down um, in, the, in the kind of the valley area that was below us. So <clears throat> I'm looking over those lights when all of a sudden I start seeing a light in the general direction that there were no cars. And um, there were some cars to the left, so I could tell what were cars. And this was a very strange, something altogether different. I saw it, and I was trying to yell at Scott, which I think he could see me on television doing. And he was on the other side of the FLIR truck, and the FLIR truck has some pretty loud uh, diesel motors. So I don't think he could hear me at first. So I'm trying to get the cameras, trying to get Scott and everyone to come over and take a look at this thing. But, yes, I saw it first. Um, I just happened to be looking in that direction because – the beacons that we had placed on the ground were in front of it. So it's hard for me to guesstimate how far this object was. 
I'm going to say probably eight miles at least, eight wow. to ten miles, maybe more. Um, wow. But yeah, I, I just I just happened to see it. We watched it for a little while, and then it went out. That, that yeah, that, that was wild. I, I thought that was really interesting because it seemed to be very similar to some of the things I see. Because a lot of my uh, lights that I see that are are way out there. They're over yeah. Cypress, which is five, six, seven miles away, and I got a five times zoom on my night vision device and. I've seen some, you know, kind of like hover on top of the um, uh, pine trees in the daytime as well. So that's why I was going to ask you because it, it looked very similar on the on the actions, mm -hmm. uh, what it looked like. So I, I your what you mentioned, you know, with this possibility, it sounds very sound that it could be plasma, it could be ger uh, ge geological, geological. Thank you. Right. Um, but you know, maybe it's UFO related as well because guys I'm don't. Seeing, don't get me wrong. I, I'm, I'm only saying that in the case of Marfa, the ones that are not car lights um, are either, you know, these these plasma balls or they're a very rare kind of uh, mirage. But that, I, I don't I'm not saying that what's going on in Vancouver or Myrtle Beach is is, def, is plasma because I, I don't know that. I'm just I'm just saying yeah. that in Marfa and in some ghost light situations, that's what we think it is. Yeah, Just no, it's, it was very intriguing, and that's why it, it, when Joe sent it to me, it really um, uh, surprised me because it uh, brought back memories of some of the stuff that I've seen over here. And again, a lot of stuff I, I haven't filmed because it was too fast. Um, I mean, I got so many different things. I got four different types of UFOs filmed that I see on a regular basis here in Vancouver, and I don't know why nobody else. I know there's a few other people here in Vancouver that do a lot of sky watching, um, also film, but nothing like I'm filming. I just I don't get it. Why Why me? <laughs> well, you're just are you you're just out. Are you downtown? Are you I'm downtown? right downtown? And I'm you know and I'm doing a lot of it too. I'm I'm, I'm sky watching a lot. You know when it's summertime, it's a clear sky. I'm up there. You know every second night for sure uh, for a couple hours at least at a time. Well, Vancouver Vancouver's a beautiful city, man. I I, I would love to go there. <laughs> Well, you know what? I know where these UFOs are landing. We can talk more about it because I want to do um, uh, a trek out to Cypress Park. That's where they're going. That's where you'll see my videos, where you'll see a lot of them are descending to. And, and it's a big national park. It's really isolated. There's Sasquatch you know, sightings there. There are people getting, you know, disappearing in that whole park. And it's right close to the city. Mm. It's like Charles minutes I'll outside. Charles, I'll get the two of you in touch with each other. Yeah, okay. And I'll make sure that sure. gets done. Thanks for the update. <laughs> and Charles, anytime, please. You're always welcome. Yeah, and thank you for um, inviting me on the show here for a moment and ask these questions and uh, continue. And looking our, forward our pleasure. To thank you very All much. Right. Thanks, Michael. Right, take care, Charles. Charles uh, was on uh, a few months ago, and he was really, uh, really impressing us with his chasing of the lights with the hexacopter and uh you know there's uh, he was an example we were using it there's a lot of people out there or, or just adamant they're seeing something different than everyone else and uh they've gone through all the, all the other channels and they're getting creative and uh as he has and he said best thing he could do is go after them but it's hard sure. to do when you're in a, a city area so he turned to modern technology i thought it was i thought it was a brilliant move Absolutely. Uh, and, uh, it's, you know, he's just using the tools that he has and you know, doing the best he can. But, you know, uh, there are things going on. And uh, we're back to the topic that how many people are really looking up, you know, uh, multiple times. It's not just seeing something once, but it's, it's knowing there's a phenomenon happening and paying attention to it are two completely different things. But uh, let's get right back to it, man. Uh, Michael. I was yes. digging. I was digging into you about uh, life, life beyond, and life, life here, life within, right. and life without. Uh, the possibility of life beyond has to exist. It, sure. it, uh, I believe it does. Uh, now, do you feel? Uh, and I understand this. This is a personal opinion. Do you feel that there was any sort of uh, integration? Do you think that there was uh, any point that an intelligent species was here? Uh, for a lack of a better term, in, for guidance of, in any way uh, amongst any species, not just human? Um, well, yeah, I, 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 listen, I, I certainly think that's a possibility. Um, Giorgio Sucolos, um came on my show a couple of times back when I was doing Dark Matter, and um, I consider him a friend. And 
ever since I was a kid, I, I was, I started out reading the Von Daniken books when I was like in fourth and fifth grade. So the idea of the ancient astronaut has always been a strong possibility to me. I was raised a Methodist, you know, a Christian. And, um, but I also like the work of Graham Hancock. You know, he believes that, you know, that we're, we're not talking about extraterrestrials here, but instead we're talking about a hidden portion of, of, of human history, which I also think is a good possibility. Listen, I, do I think extraterrestrials came here in the ancient past? Yes. Do I think there's a possibility that um, there is a missing part of human history? Yes. So I think both of those things have happened. And at the same time, that does not discount religion. Because if God exists, then God is something that we as humans cannot comprehend. We can describe it and make descriptions of it and try to think about what it is. But Truly, it is beyond our power to comprehend something like that. So if God exists then, and, and God can create universes or multiverses, then uh, the idea of aliens uh, should not intervene or, or should not pose a problem to a religious person. I, I'm with sense. you on that. It, it, it does because it really – it shouldn't be a religious thing. If anything, no. in, in my opinion, it should – be understood by sure. all religions. Right. Uh, well, the Vatican has, an, I guess they took a new step to embrace it. You're right. Two yeah, weeks ago, they, they did make a statement saying that it's not outside the realm of God. That they're right. If God can do it here, I mean, he did create, if, if we're looking at it through the Vatican, he did create all that's known. Right. So just because we haven't gone somewhere else to find it yet doesn't mean it doesn't exist. That's right. And the only reason I bring that up is because if any of our listeners, you know, are, are, you know, it's weird when you start getting into this kind of territory, then, you know, some people start getting upset, you know, and particularly fundamentalists, you know, and not, and not just Christians, but, but religious people of all types. The other thing that bugs me while I'm on this ramble is when people of a particular country get upset when people say, oh, well, you're talking about extraterrestrials being involved with the building of certain uh, monuments or whatever will really we take offense at that because what you're saying is that the people of this country could not have made that and I'm not saying that what I'm saying is that that's the wrong way to look at it and Sukalos and Danik, Van Daniken they, they don't say that extraterrestrials made these things they're saying that they helped guide humans to make them and in some cases, we've got these anomalous edifices and monoliths and buildings that I'm sorry, I, I do not believe that we can construct them now. And when you look at a place like I believe it's Olatambo, uh, you know, in South America, where sheer walls of stone have just been cut out and removed in a perfect um, square or rectangle and as if it were just cut out and then lifted away from a cliff um, and then moved somewhere else. I mean, I, I don't know how these things happen unless a extraterrestrials assisted or b we have an unexplained portion of human history i it might be a bit of both yes <laughs> but uh you know i'm i'm there with you uh when they say there's no evidence of any interaction well you know it doesn't always have to be uh, a a genetic evidence footprint which by you know we have to remember we really are in, in the infancy of studying genetics absolutely Just, just because we're able to identify a few things and we feel we're certain on it, it we're, we're still in its infancy, for goodness sake. Yes. Uh, but you, there's evidence all over the place, in my opinion, uh, just as you mentioned all of these stones. There's, there's a lot of things that were created definitely by man that seem to uh, break the laws of nature when it comes yes. to uh, mankind's ability. Uh, sure. yeah, you I mean know. It certainly, if we, you come to a point to say, well, physics, man's, man's physics don't allow this, well, then the only other thing is some sort of intervention or uh, just a, a higher intellect that there was a capability be, beyond what we understand. And uh, then we have to say, where did that originate from? Because we're supposed to be coming out of a Stone Age or really in a lot of these larger structures, megaliths we're talking about, we were in the Stone Age in, in yes. most, most of the world. Absolutely, and uh, we had copper tools, uh, or yeah. or less at these times. And uh, you're 
you're not going to build a house today with a copper hammer. You know, you're not, you're not going to get much done with it at all. Uh, I was so, reading today. I was reading today that, um, and I I don't know if this is verified. I was watching. I was reading on some uh, a bit of a sketchy site, but it may be true. It, it was interesting. I mean, they were saying that they discovered this year that the way that portions of the Forbidden City in China were created, and I didn't know how large some of these stones were. They're saying that some of these are you know thirty, fifty tons. Um, is that they were quarried in a particular area, but they were pulled by a series of ramps and pulled on icy roads. And they would pull them on the icy roads to reduce friction and that the workers would dig holes like every 50 meters to try to get water out of the ground and put on the ice. Listen, maybe that's the way they did it. I I, I don't know. Um, I hadn't heard that before. And I was just like, hey, some ice, dragging a big stone. Maybe that's how they did it. I, I don't know. I um, Certainly there's no ice in um, Egypt. And uh so they didn't do it that way. So I, I don't know. I, I find it all very fascinating. And I try to keep my mind open um, to a lot of things. And, I, and listen, it is inevitable that we are going to find things in the next couple of decades that are going to blow people's minds. And how how we get that information out to the populace um, remains to be seen. Because, you know, if you, you, were, you were talking about Mars earlier. Um, the interesting thing about Mars is... In the 70s, you know, we began to see what we thought might be monuments. People talk about the face on Mars, and then they laugh it off. Well, guess what? There's a lot more to it than just the so-called face on Mars. The whole Cydonia region and some of the geometry there is quite complex. And yet, you know, that's stuff that most people have never heard about because the channels of distributing that information um, are not really um, – that's not something they want to talk about so much. So – when these other things start to pose their heads and they become inconvenient, um, it'll, it's going to be an interesting next 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah, I, I'm in full with agreement. With, I'm right there because we're, we're in leaps and bounds. But I, I think in the, over the just the last 20 years, uh, obviously we all know technology has really taken off. But I think we, we've really – been making a lot of technology integrated so a lot of things can work with other things as we're yes. finding out like with apps you, you find your phones are capable of so many things uh, I think that's where we're really starting to uh, make a, a good progress in technology because before it was everything only worked for itself you had this and you needed software for that right. and and nothing went together but now we're, we're building technology that's multi-purpose I mean sure. my cell phone has more technology than the first lunar landing that's right. Uh, you know, uh, by far, by, by far. And that's, uh, that's empowering to individual researchers and investigators because now we have tools, even just consumer-grade tools, that far, far outweigh anything that our predecessors had. So if anything, it should be encouraging to people who um, want to look into these subjects. And listen, you don't have to have a TV show. You don't have to have a radio show. You don't have to be a scientist. I'll be honest, I think a lot of the good information is going to come from people like yourself who are just going out there and doing it because hard scientists aren't going to really want to fool with this. They're afraid it's going to hurt their reputation. It's going to kill their grants. You know, They're going to lose their tenure, whatever. So I think a lot of the really good information and good research is going to come from individuals who have a passion and a desire to know. Yeah, that, that's where it's going to come from. It's because they're – they're the ones uh, less reluctant to call it quits when they're met with hesitation right off the bat. Yes. But, you know, uh, back to this, uh, uh, you, you really got me thinking here on the the, the early stoneworks yeah. on uh, early people here. Now, uh, a lot of biblical stories and a lot of early texts do say these very things that there was uh, a hand that stepped in. and Sure. And a lot of times it's – a simple the hand that stepped in taught knowledge and yeah. uh and so you know these are all things that humans were capable of so a lot of times it's uh, a loss of knowledge uh but it still doesn't account for the the uh laws of physics that were broken to to build such things like well some... are, are, are are the laws that govern the technology that we should have had at that time very well said 
Because here's the deal. I was listening to Graham Hancock the other day, a man who I have an immense amount of respect for. Mm -hmm. And he was saying that he, you know, he's not going to poo poo the idea of, of, of ancient astronauts fully, but he said in his research, you know, and, and I, he's a tremendous researcher. Um, he said, look, in, in my travels, I haven't seen anything that convinced me that these were things that were not, that were beyond the ability of humans to make. Okay, fair enough. Um, but that doesn't mean that he's right. And the other thing is that the point, the larger point, I'm straying, I'm, I'm going to have to have a cup of tea in a minute. Um, Ooh, that sounds good. Is that, is that he's saying that he does believe that there's this portion of our history that is lost. And the people that we're talking about that perhaps, you know, ancient aliens uh, on, on the History Channel or whatever, where they would jump the gun and say that it was definitely extraterrestrials, our gods appearing to be extraterrestrials, could be remnants of a lost civilization who were ascended masters or teachers left over from the first civilization who, in various places, um, took the position of teachers to, um, to the civilizations that have since forgotten the knowledge. So, listen, I don't know... Um, but what I do know is we do not have solid answers for these types of uh, strange uh, monuments that, you know, they just defy explanation. Yeah, the, since the earliest days, too, uh, and with Graham Hancock, uh, he said for years now, uh, putting, let's say, the Great Pyramids, he's putting them back at approximately 10,500 B.C., and uh, he makes a great case for it. Yeah. He, re he really does, and it, it makes really good sense. Uh, in a lot of the oldest texts I found, where, uh, even with uh, Plato writing on the earliest days, when Plato speaks of it, Atlantis way back in, in 9,000 years prior to him, uh, you know, he says it's, it's long gone, but he also mentions that the remnants of it, it can still be seen. You know, so he's, he's talking of structures that have been around for ages as well. Uh, and, you know, that's that's a, a, a well-documented writing going back to 300 B.C. And, you know, these were old stories at that time. But yes. each, Egypt's been passing down traditions forever. And, yeah. uh, and the deal is, well, right now, I didn't mean to cut you off, but one of the interesting places yeah. right now, of course, is Turkey. And mm -hmm. if you look at Gebekli Tepe, which, which even precedes Sumeria, and I, listen – the more we look, the more mysteries that we find. I mean, Gobekli, Te Gobekli Tepli, um, I can't even pronounce it. Right? <laughs> it's I'm, a tough I'm one. Tired. Um, this is when we should have been, you know, barely hunter-gatherers. Uh, this is Stone Age man creating this enormous complex that, you know, hundreds of acres of these stone circular buildings. And... How, you know, there's there's not a good explanation for how or why these folks did this, and um, you know, there's there's going to be other places that are going to continue to throw uh, wrenches in the machine of a conventional view of human history. I'm with you there, man. Because uh, Gobleki Tepe, you're right that that thing's back 10,000 BC, and those structures that are there just weren't co uh, coincidental, and they weren't just additions that went on there. There's mathematics there uh, in every one of those structures. There's fantastic quarrying that's going on. Never mind yeah. the relief carvings that are in right. these uh, giant stones. I, I can't even quote the tonnage on them, but they're massive. Yes. Uh, they're massive. Uh, 10,000 BC man shouldn't be able to haul these things around as we know it today. But these stones, they're, they're, they're fantastic. They're all quarried, right? They're all cut. Amazing, but it's the relief carvings that are just the the cherry on top because uh, the when they do these relief carvings, there's no way to, there's you, there's no way to fix it. You know, it's not uh, it, it's it's not carved out of the stone. The the stone is carved around it, so it's literally an extension of the stone. And there's archaic animals. There's there's animals that are possibly extinct or just different kind of looking animals that are there. It was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. and, and the the human achievement is amazing because this is a time where we really shouldn't have had structures like that, uh, nor the mathematics to do it. So right. there must have been uh, 
there must have been generations of this already going on. This wasn't just a spur of the moment thing. Right. Uh, and it's I'm still puzzled to the end on why it would be buried in sand. Right. That's that that part is really interesting because it's almost as if they did not want well, they didn't want someone to come in immediately and rehabilitate it, or they wanted it intentionally buried so they could only be found at a much later time. Um, it's kind of like Puma Punko in, in in the respect that you know those stones look like they've almost been blown apart intentionally, like almost like whoever built it did not want anyone else to be able to come back and use it because perhaps it was such a um, well-crafted shelter that they would have maybe, and I'm speculating here, of course, an unfair, an unfair advantage over any of the indigenous peoples who might be around there. It's like they exploded it intentionally. So in Go Gobeki Tepe, um, the fact that they buried it leads me to believe they either didn't want people to be there after they left or they wanted it to be preserved. Hey guys, hold on just a second. I'm still talking, please. I've got my family, my kids are getting rusty. Oh, it's all. Uh, um, or they just, they wanted it intentionally preserved for an extended period of time. Yeah. Because to preserve it, I do understand it. You know, if it's, if they understand they, it has to be abandoned for whatever reason. And it was of, of great importance. I, I could understand that. Uh, but you know, it, it's like when we speak on go, go Tepe, I'm having problems with it too. Yeah. It's hard. You know, they, they buried, they buried that in sand yes. and, and I've heard a, a few uh, different arguments on it. And I did speak with Linda Moulton Howe on it a while ago when she had returned that a lot of the sand was not even local sand. Interesting. Uh, even even if it were immediately local, it's an incredible undertaking to bury Absolutely. these things. I mean, the, there are so many of these structures. Yes. Uh, just to fill one of them with buckets of sand, oh my goodness, I can't imagine uh, the undertaking for that. Uh, so, you know, if there were in, in a necessity to abandon ship per se, they still had enough time to to bury the city or, yes. or bury the temples, whatever it may be. But um, I I'm grateful they did because it, it did preserve it so well. Yes. Uh, I know a lot of the wood timbers are long gone that were there. Uh, that's expected. But, uh, you know, that would only show a lot of water erosion through time. Uh, you know, we could have lost all these relief structures that were there. Yes. Uh, but, you know, in South America, uh, when you're talking Puma Punku, when they look like they're blown up, they they, they really That's do. What it looks like to me. I mean, they, I, I, no, they really do look like uh, something had laid destruction to it. You know, yeah. something, uh, and, and it it looks so hard to do because everything's tied in so well. Yeah. You know, these structures, these things, these structures were built so well for so long ago. Uh, the the intricate carvings, how how well they fit. And I mean, a lot of these things are still standing strong, which is incredible. Yeah. Uh, we've we've lost a lot of technology and a lot of info. We had uh, a Professor Ruggiero from University of Chicago on here, and he's a uh, he's an expert and a historian on early American civilizations, uh, all the Americans, and he was telling us that excuse me, that uh, you could see just in the arrowheads used by uh, Native American populace that going back to the year approximately 10,000 BC, we were really crafting some very nice arrowheads. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they were of uh, quality design. They were very efficient. And he, he wanted to stress that on the rear of these, they, were, they did have the angle on it, so it would be hard to come out of the animal. But the rear had been fluted in such a nice way that they were fashioning 20 or 30 of these, uh, 20 or 30 and carrying them in a bag. And they were able to be interchangeable on shafts. So wow. instead of having to fashion 30 spears, you just did your tip. So when you threw the arrow, the, the shaft fell, but the arrow stayed embedded. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said if you, if you started at that point and you work your way back, he said, you, you could just see just in arrowheads alone, technology is just falling apart. He said, then you get to 
around the time of Egypt, and they need several of them. They, they're multi-purpose. And then he said, and, and you also see right around that point in Egypt where uh, Egyptian building is becoming uh, less profound. It's, uh, yeah, right. you know, we eventually, we, we go from uh, fine granite and limestones down to the last dynasties were stacking mud bricks. And he said, and then you get down to arrowheads or were, were pretty much just crude instruments until we came over here to, to the Americas and we found Indians were still using them or American Native Americans, I should say. Which leads one to believe that something happened that caused a massive reduction in organized intellect and technology. Some form of cataclysm occurred that made us forget some of that information. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. And because everyone's always saying there's no proof, there's no uh, proof that we've been losing or forgetting technology. And, uh, and uh, the pro professor we had on, he's saying that that is science proof. That was our technology. That's yes. That's what we were doing. But but then we also have to account for these structures that were here. Were, were, were these people building them or were a lot of these already here? Because if at 10,000 BC, uh, 9,000 BC, we're already losing our skills with just arrowheads, uh, it, it's kind of hard to believe we've uh, started building structures but uh, lost our finest tools for survival. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and I understood his argument on that. Some people ahead, argue that, uh, like Teotihuacan, um, yes. the, the latest, the last um, civilization that occupied that area, they don't know who built it. Right. It was built whoever knows how long prior to. Carbon dating says one thing, whatever. Um, but, you know, this isn't the first instance in human history where uh, people build on top of civilization. Civilizations build on top of other civilizations occupying other buildings that were, that were previously built. So, I mean, Joe, I think you're right. That there's a very good possibility that these things, you know, some of these structures were there prior to. I, I find it irrefutable, in my opinion. I, I uh, as uh, Michael just said, that, you know, th I really do feel there is a strong possibility there was uh, civilizations here for a long time of high knowledge, of high knowledge. Uh, for all we know, there were civilizations here that lasted 5,000 years, 10,000 years, and maybe somewhat of a peaceful understanding civilization where they would have grown in time as opposed to uh, – warring it out as we still do today yes uh it's it's quite possible uh, a lot of these ancient stories tell just that that there was a wonderful uh human race a, a race that was uh worldwide and uh that there was major cataclysms and few survived and and the few that survived uh, have uh tried to pass that knowledge on and all of our earliest civilizations tell similar stories of this. And uh, in e Egypt's no different. Uh, Samaria is no different. Uh, and, and there's signs of these ancient civilizations all over the world. But I, I think what, what, take, what trumps it all is I really do think that it's just a forgotten knowledge. I think that we, we've just forgotten generation to generation. And uh, I really don't know how we can reverse it but it seems like whenever we find out really amazing things today we're really just uh, figuring out how something was done a long time ago mm -hmm. i understand technology is progressing i understand that uh but but we don't understand so many other things it's uh we just look at things with wonder when we have to is we have to know that these things were all done by man I understand there might have been guidance, whether it was a, a technology or information. However, uh, it was still done with us. You know, the, it it is possible we can do these things. Uh, but I, I I think we need the knowledge. Uh, we need the books. I, I still hold true, man. I one of the saddest days in the history of man, in my opinion, is when the Library of Alexandria. Uh, burned down. Exactly. You know, from what I understand, it was. I mean, if we're, we we could talk to a blue in the face, and and all I want to say is, where can I go with all the documents when I know they would? That was what their business was: was stocking every writing they possibly can from all reaches of the earth. Yeah, uh, that was the better. Days a terrible shame. Yeah, and, and and to to know it was 
set on purpose. The fire was set on purpose. Yeah. Was, uh, ironically, the gentleman who lit the fire was known as Peter the Reader. So, you know, <laughs> I'll never forget him. He, he took so much knowledge from us because uh, that was the place where – that was the safe house. That was where, where things were stored. And uh, historically, that's where our greatest minds did their thinking. And uh, it, it, what a shame. Uh, I still think there's a lot more to be found uh, for a lot of these lost documents. And on the other hand, I still feel that a lot of great knowledge has been found where either we're, we're unaware of what it is or the wrong people are looking at it where it makes no sense to them or we're just not getting it. They're just not providing it to us. Right. It might be a little bit of everything because, you know, there's there, there's still a lot of uh, – religious value before historical value in all these places we're talking about. And, uh, I mean, it's too bad uh, the Fertile Crescent isn't such a hostile place because, I mean, that's – you could basically set up an archaeological tent over the whole area. Yep. I, I could only imagine the, the, the answers that we would get that are really just lying under some sand. You know, we're, we're really not finding much these days. Especially here in the Americas, Michael, you ever notice that? Really, not much is coming out about uh, prior to Columbus coming here. You know, we're, well, deal, we're I, really not finding out anything. Well, I, I, luckily for us, I think a little more is coming out now than it has in the past because I actually tried to pitch a show like five years ago just about the civilizations of North America. You know, um, pre-Columbus and. I couldn't really get anybody interested in the time, but now we have a show on, I believe it's History Channel, called America Unearthed, and it's a it's an it's an enjoyable show. So there is some information that's trickling out to the uh, the populace, uh, at least more so than usual. Mike, Michael, we're coming to the end here. Okay. We're going to have to have you back on. Cool. Everyone, thank you for listening tonight. Again, Michael Parker, please go to his site coverttruth.com. Follow him on Twitter at Michael Parker LA. Thank you once again, Michael, for joining us tonight. Thank you for pleasure. listening to Researchers on a Mission Radio, Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. Good night, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Cheers. to our listeners. Revolution Radio is you. Thanks to your continuous support and participation, Revolution Radio will embark on its fourth year on air bigger and better than ever. You, the listeners, have made Revolution Radio what it is. The number one commercial-free talk radio station on the web with nearly 24 hours of live programming delivering directly to you the most cutting-edge information available. You, the listeners, have become some of our most popular radio hosts. You, the listeners, offer feedback that molds our programming to appeal to a worldwide audience. You, the listener, provide eyes on the ground, reporting about newsworthy events in your area, and you, the listener, are the lifeblood of this station. We love you, and thank you for being a treasured member of our Revolution Radio family. From all of us to all of you, have a happy and safe holiday season, and let's make this new year a success once again together. Thank you. Enjoy your extra big-ass fries. You didn't give me no fries. I got an empty box. Would you like another...